How does the Quran approach other religions? Is it open to other religions? Is it for coexistence? Or is it polemical? Does it only have negative things to say about other religions? These are some of the questions that I address in this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I speak with Professor Munim Suri, an authority on questions of exclusivism and inclusivism in Islam. I'm so grateful that you're here. Please take a moment to like this video, to subscribe to the channel, and to hit that bell button so you're notified when new material on Exploring the Quran and the Bible drops. Hello, Munim. Thank you so much for coming back to Exploring the Quran and the Bible. Of course, this is my pleasure to join you. Everyone, uh, Munim Suri is a distinguished scholar, also a very good friend. So this is a special pleasure to have him with us. He already recorded uh, a session with us on Exploring the Quran and the Bible, where we spoke a lot about questions of traditionalism and revisionism, um, which is connected to his second book on Islamic origins. So I'd encourage everyone to, to, see, uh, to check out that video as well. Uh, but in this video on Exploring the Quran and the Bible, we're going to speak uh, to larger questions about inclusivism, exclusivism. Is the Quran a book that's open to other religions, that's just filled with polemics against other religions? Uh, how do you sort through all of those questions? So I think this is a really important, uh, I mean, sometimes uh, sessions we have on this channel are about really like technical, academic sort of stuff. But this is a, a subject that obviously has real connections to coexistence in the world today. So uh, it's a really important episode. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Munim, I'll just start with a brief a brief introduction, then we'll get right into it. Sound okay? Sure, yep, of course. Okay, super. So everyone, Professor Munim Suri is Associate Professor of Theology at Notre Dame. He earned his PhD from the University of Chicago Divinity School in 2012. He did his undergrad and graduate studies at the International Islamic University in Islamabad, Pakistan, but you're not actually from Pakistan originally, right? No, I'm from Indonesia. <laughs> from Indonesia. Uh, he also did a master's degree from the University of California in Los Angeles. And together, Munim and I edit the journal, along with some friends at Birmingham University, the journal Islam and Christian Muslim Relations. Munim is the author of a number of works, including the book Scriptural Polemics, the Quran in Other Religions, that's published by Oxford University Press, and is uh, intimately connected to what we'll be speaking about today, so go and buy that book. He's also the author of Controversies Over Islamic Origins, an Introduction to Traditionalism and Revisionism, published in 2021, and uh, Hot Off the Press, uh, published in 2022, uh, from De Gruyter, uh, the Quran with cross-references. I mean, very briefly, maybe we'll turn back to this book at the end of the program, but uh, this is an incredible resource. Uh, it is the first time that both the Arabic text and Quran translation is presented along with marginal cross-references. So you can look at the Quran, see the Arabic and the English, and then immediately see related passages to the verse that interests you. So it should be on the desk of every student and scholar of the Quran. Uh, is, is anything you'd add about the book, uh, Muni? Thank you for, for, for promoting that book. So no, that, that is already very generous. So thank you. Yeah, and it's it's priced reasonably with a great price to Greuter. So I'd encourage everyone to get that book. Okay, let's get right into the heart of the matter, everyone. Uh, this is a really difficult topic to address because there are divergent views about the Quran and its, its message about non-Islamic religions. Sometimes we seem to hear two different messages. I mean, from some people here, Oh, the Quran is uh, a book that is uh, polemical against other religions, even hateful towards other religions. Uh, all non-Muslims are kuffar or unbelievers. And then we hear others who say, no, 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 uh, the Quran is actually not just okay, but it is a generous book towards the other. Uh, it, you know, they might refer to verses such as uh, Quran 2, 256, which it says there's no compulsion in religion or other verses in the Quran. Some would say, actually, the Quran is the path forward in thinking about coexistence between religions. Uh, so uh, how do you sort through this? I mean, wh where do you how do you respond when you hear both of those messages? I, I think. Yeah, I would I would agree with that assessment. You know, generally speaking, the Quran is ambivalent when it comes to how to treat the other. Like, right? so on the one hand, you find passages in the Quran that seem to condemn the other as unbelievers and even encourage violence against them. You know, some scholars use the term jihadi verses or short verses to describe that sort of passages from the Muslim scripture 
that promote a conflictual relationship uh, with non-believers. So uh, chapter nine uh, is called Surah Taubah, um, which is regarded as one of the latest chapters that Muhammad claimed to receive, is uh, full of that kind of elements, uh, which is like in the question of violence, including, uh, this is something that we might discuss later, um, including uh, verse 29, uh, which basically says, um, uh, قَاتِلُوا أَلَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَلَا بِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَلَا يُحَرِّمُونَ مَا حَرَّمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَلَا يَدِينُونَ الدِّينَ الْحَقِّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ حَتَّى يُؤْتُوا الْجِزَّةِ أَنْ يَدِينْ وَهُمْ صَاغِرُونَ Fight those who do not believe in God in the last day and do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden and do not follow the religion of truth among the people of the book, among those who are given the book, uh, until they pay uh, jizya, the tax, uh, from their hand and they are humble. So this uh, this 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 uh, verse certainly reflect that kind of verse that seem to uh, encourage hateful toward the other. However, uh, other passages of the Quran seem to promote peaceful coexistence and allow for religious freedom. So you mentioned uh, uh, chapter two, uh, verse uh, two hundred and fifty six, I guess, la ikrah fidin, that there is no conversion and religion. And also one of the most uh, cited verses in the Quran that seem to promote this kind of attitude, which is like more peaceful existence or, or religious tolerance, is uh, chapter 109. It's called Surah Al-Kafirun. Al-Kafirun itself means the, the unbelievers or infidel. Mm -hmm. So the last, the last verse of this chapter, chapter 109, says, Lakum dinukum waliyadin, right? Which means... Uh, for you, your religion, for me, mine. So these inclusivist passages, uh, just like the exclusivist one, the more, uh, the, the more the, you know, those, those seem to encourage violence, are uh, scattered throughout the Muslim scripture. So in a way that, you know, that, that, that the Quran include both elements, both, you know, peace and also violence. So which is, which is quite interesting that, that both attitude can be, you know, get, get, you, you, you can't find like proof text from the Muslim scripture to support each one of those. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, maybe a connected question. I mean, these are difficult things, right? Because uh, uh, they um, they reflect differences in um, uh, within personalities, within the readers of the text, within the, among the believing community, um, and also attitudes either hostile or friendly towards the Quran from non-Muslims. So I mean, uh, one one real problem maybe. I mean, what here? Let, let me ask you what you think about this. Um, sometimes you have non-Muslims who will only speak about the exclusivist or polemical material in the Quran, and use that to characterize the entire book as right. uh, a polemical book or a hateful book. Yeah, and uh, they can. Uh, they can um, defend themselves or defend their claims by referring to certain currents within Islam mm -hmm. who celebrate those verses, right? So, uh, you know, certain Salafi or maybe jihadi Salafi currents, uh, which uh, don't try to contextualize or modify or reread those passages in light of the current current situation, but say, yeah, this is Islam, deal with it. So. Does that make sense? How a non-Muslim, yeah, yeah. a polemical non-Muslim could try to vilify the Quran and then say, look, I'm right because there's this Salafi over there who says the same thing. Yeah, I think the pro that is the problem, actually, you, you know, in the sense that, you know, most people have their own favorite passages, right? So those who are helpful to the Quran or even, you know, the Salafis who claim to represent what the Quran says, they uh, prefer certain passages of the Quran to support their ideology. But on the other hand, you find also someone, some people like those who, you know, uh, you know, got involved in interreligious conversation, for instance, they focus on certain elements of the Quran. So what is needed, I guess, is how to uh, read the Quran more holistically and over, uh, you know, uh, interpretation that seem to, uh, you know, to, to, to reflect the modern times. Mm. So that's what I, I did in my work, in my first book, uh, dealing with polemical passages of the Quran and uh, try to see how those polemical passages, by polemical passages, I mean, 
those uh, verse of the Quran that not only describe other religion negatively, but also criticize them. Right. So my my my, my attempt was to understand uh, or to see how those difficult passages have been understood by modern Muslims. You know, uh, because is it possible to reinterpret those polemical passages to contextualize in modern context? You know, in 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 context yes. where. Yes. You know, violence against the other in yes. whatever way is is still considered yes. as as not the way forward. Yes, yes. Now, a typical move uh, that I've seen to um, defend or to explain some of the polemical material in the Quran is to turn to the Bible mm -hmm. and say, "Oh, look at this passage from Deuteronomy or a passage from Exodus in the context of the Exodus of the Israelites." And eventually with the book of Joshua, their conquest of the land of Canaan. And there are plenty of passages in which God is commanding the Israelites to uh, fight and kill uh, non-Israelites. Uh, so there's plenty of violent material there. Um, so uh, I don't know. Let me ask you first about that. Like, what do you think about that move when you see a Muslim saying, listen, you point out this verse of the Quran. But actually, look at this verse in Deuteronomy, it's that much worse. I, I've seen this by, you know, not just online polemics where you might expect it. But I remember just a, a brief anecdote. When I first came to Notre Dame, they assigned a book by Sayyid Hussein Nasser, the very well-known philosopher, professor at George Washington. Uh, I think it was called The Heart of Islam, something like that, uh, this book. And he used that tactic a lot in that book. And I was sort of surprised. I was surprised Notre Dame had assigned it to all of its students at Catholic University. And I was surprised that he sort of used that tactic, which I felt like is OK. But I don't know. What do you think about that? Pointing yeah. out violent stuff in the Bible to make the Quran look relatively yeah. better. Yeah, I don't think that is like, you know, healthy comparisons without looking at the context. Right. So that that is what 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 sometimes happen that people look you know, compare the two scriptures and then uh, say which one is more violent uh, without looking at the context in which those scriptures emerge. So, you know, in, in the medieval time, perhaps in the in, in at the time when the Bible, uh, you know, were put together uh, or, or written, uh, the only way to survive is is, is a violence. So, so you know, we, we should look at, at the context, I guess, in order to understand and even appreciate, you know, the existence of violent, uh, you know, verses in both scriptures. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's interesting that uh, uh, it, it, instead of doing that, there's a tendency of people to, uh, to, to make it a competition between Quran and Bible mm -hmm. on this question and, and others. Um, okay, so in, turning back to the Quran itself and questions of exclusivism and plural, pluralism and uh, inclusivism, uh, an, another way of um, vilifying the Quran sometimes is to say, uh, listen, the situation here is that, for example, you mentioned Surah at the Surah 9 before, yes. which has more violent material. Um, Surah Al-Anfal is another one, Surah 8, that people sometimes bring up. Yes. And they would say, well, these, these verses that have this sort of violent material or these surahs, these chapters, uh, are by tradition assigned to the Medinan period. Mm -hmm. And then in mentioning sort of a friendly pluralist or inclusivist verse, one example you gave was Surah Al-Kafirun, and said, well, surahs so like that are from the Meccan period. So just right. for our listeners or viewers who may not know all of this, uh, by tradition, the Quranic surahs can be divided between those proclaimed by the Prophet Muhammad between 610 and 622 in Mecca. So these are called Meccan surahs. In those proclaimed by the Prophet Muhammad in Medina, between 622 and 632. And those are called, accordingly, mm -hmm. Medinan surahs. Yes. So um, anyway, so in sort of problematizing the Quran, people say, yeah, well, the friendly stuff is in Mecca, and then the more violent stuff is in Medina. Uh, and so this shows that the Quran sort of moved from openness to uh, uh, to being more closed or even hostile to the other. And I, I mean, it's, some people even say, uh, in trying to vilify the Quran, uh, that uh, this shows a certain opportunism in the Prophet. Mm -hmm. He was only open and friendly to the other when he didn't have power and couldn't impose his will. 
and then suddenly Medina, where he did have power because he was the head of state in Medina, yeah. uh, then his real colors showed. So, yeah. What do you think about that method, that argument, and all that stuff? Yeah, um, I, I too hear, you know, people say that there is a sif in the language of the Quran from uh, openness in the Meccan period to polemics in the Medinan period. Um, as you just mentioned, uh, that the Quran is divided into two parts according to the traditional approach. Uh, and, you know, th at the time when Muhammad was uh, in Mecca, you know, the Quran seemed to be uh, avoiding a kind of any military confrontation. But when uh, Muhammad moved from Mecca to Medina and his followers uh, grow in number and become stronger, then the Quran use you know more harsh language uh, concerning the other. Uh, that's that's the kind of uh, interpretation that some some people think about about the the development of the Qur the Quranic uh, attitude toward the other. Um, th there is a book by um, uh, Reuben Firestone uh, entitled "Jihad: The Origin of Holy War in the Qur in, in Islam," which is an excellent book. I, I love that book and perhaps one of the best in my view. Uh, concerning the idea of jihad in Islam, the the the, the origin of of how the, the, the you know the idea uh, developed, and and in 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 chapter you know in one chapter in that book he discussed the traditional view of how how the Quran treated the other, and according to his discussion that traditionally Muslim tend to to classify the Quranic verse concerning jihad into four categories. You know, the first category uh, is is uh, those passages of the Quran that follow under the category of uh, non-confrontation. Yes. Avoid any kind of confrontation. And then the second category, he I think he called like defensive fighting, mm -hmm. meaning you can fight for but for self-defense. Okay. And then the third, the third uh, development, uh, he 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 called it like you know initiating fight is possible. But within ancient stricture, you don't find, you know, in certain place like the haram, or you don't find during the, you know, Ramadan or something like that, right? The holy, holy, holy uh, months. Wow. And then the last time is unconditional fight, just fight, like you know, whatever. So it, for, from the traditional point of view, this these uh, different approaches of the Quran uh, are often understood in terms of the gradual development. You know that 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 this is this is only this only this is also the way how those different approaches to the Quran have been understood by traditional Muslims. However, uh, this this reading, in my view, is not supported by the text of the Quran itself, because if we examine the Quran more closely, we will see some overlaps in the language of the Quran. I mean, there is no clear cut division. Uh, between the Meccan and the Medinan messages of, of the Muslim scripture. The, the Meccan uh, uh, Quran does not necessarily reflect uh, totally po polemical you know, uh, attitude toward non-Muslims uh, because one of you know, the most cited uh, uh, verses in the Quran that seem to promote a peaceful coexistence can can be found in the in the Meccan, uh, you know, in the Medinan. In the uh, Medinan. Uh, you said Meccan before, but I think you meant Medina. Yeah, in the yes. Medinan, yeah, in the yes. Medinan chapters. You know, take the example of uh, you know, this is the you know that I mean, I like the, the whole thing, but I really like this beautiful passage of the Quran, which says uh, in in chapter two, uh, verse uh, two hundred uh, two hundred. Uh, so verse sixty. Uh, let me. I think verse, verse sixty is two, right? Uh, which says, uh, you know, in Aladina Amanu, Waladina had the one Sora was so be in, Man Amana Billa, those who believe, a Jewish Christian, Sabian, whoever believe in God in the last day and uh, work righteously, mm -hmm. they will receive that word from their Lord and they, they will not, you know, uh, no fear upon them. Fear or not, the, not mm -hmm. will they, they grieve. So look look at this. Like this is one of the most inclusive passages in the Muslim scripture that can be found in the in the Madinan uh, uh, chapters of the Quran. And it has a, it has a doublet verse, as you know, in Surah sort of five, which is exactly. for some the very last surah of the Quran. Right, right. The, you know, this 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 passage of the Quran can can you know is repeated in 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 one of the latest the latest chapters of the Quran. So there are some overlaps. So I think this is one of the you know the weaknesses of the chronological reading of the Quran because it it tend to ignore 
the overlap between the Quranic, you know, messages. Yes, yes. Very interesting point. Very interesting point. Right. Uh, well, I've written a, an article called "The Problem of the Chronology of the Quran," so oh. <laughs> so I'm on board with with some of the complications about that. Yes, yes. We've been speaking about um, the terms exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism. Um, so I wanted to ask you to define them, but uh, I, I just wanted to develop the question a bit more because uh, our attention has been towards uh coexistence mm -hmm. earthly coexistence between religions thus far mostly um and sometimes uh, i think in theological language when people speak of exclusivists it, it, it refers rather to questions of salvation and not earthly coexistence yeah um, so maybe you could help us sort through that uh, a bit what does it mean when we speak of inclusive in inclusivist exclusivist and pluralist yeah, the, the, the topology that, that you just mentioned, exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism, uh, was first developed in the context of Christian approach to the other, right? So uh, although the term might have appeared much earlier, but it was Alan Reyes who put the, the two terms together. Uh, so exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism in uh, in his book entitled um, uh, Christ. Christians and religious pluralism. So the, the book was published a long time ago in 19, uh, you know, uh, 80s, I think 1983 to, to be exact, um, in which he elaborated this th these three categories. Um, so it, basically, uh, ex exclusivism referred to the idea that only my religion is, is the true path to salvation, right? So there is only one one true religion, which is mine. Like this is, the, the, you know, the, the, the path to salvation is exclusively my own faith. That's, that's the, you know, how the, the you know, the, the, the category is often understood, the paradigm. And, and, and ex exclusivism se seems to be more inclusive in the sense that, you know, each religion, each religious tradition may include some elements of truth, but still the, ult the ultimate truth is mine. So, and then you know pluralism you know although it recognizes uh, the the that the, the, the religions are different but you know this this paradigm tend to see that there is no superiority of one religion over the other each one each religion is uh, you know legitimate path to salvation so um so that's yeah that's that's like, like basically how how the categories are defined um Although, as 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 you know that you know it, you know even even though that these categories uh, developed within the Christian tradition, but then uh, they were used in, in you know in other religious tradition as well. So I yeah, I, thought, I, I I wanted to develop that a little a little bit because I'm interested in the connection between one's disposition or attitude towards the salvation of the other. Is this, mm -hmm. is the other going to heaven or hell or maybe something in between? Yeah, uh, <laughs> and um, one's disposition towards the other during this life on earth. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I wonder what you think about that. Um, I mean, I've heard some people say that, uh, you know, you don't actually have to affirm that the other, you don't have to be a pluralist to be to be a friend with the other. Um, you could be an ex inclusivist or exclusivist even. And be a friend with the other but then people respond sometimes they're like how could you be friend be be my friend if you think i'm going to hell like isn't there some i don't know like cognitive dissidence or problem with that uh i mean how closely linked are one's attitude towards the salvation of the other and interpersonal relationships between members of different religions here on earth yeah, I, I I tend to to think that you know that believing in the same thing is not necessary for peaceful coexistence. You can be exclusivist, but still you can, you know, live peacefully uh, between one another. What is needed, I guess, is not to impose the sameness. You don't have to be like inclusivist, pluralist in order, you know, to to live peacefully, right? So what is needed, I guess, is to respect each other. 
because at the end of the day, we will know that, you know, especially when talking about, you know, Christianity and Islam, we will know that the two religions are different. I mean, they have very serious differences. Um, so what we, what we can do just to respect each other, take the example of this notion of the Trinity and Tawhid, right? Although, you know, uh, uh, you know um, both religions are monotheistic, right? But their concept of the divine is really seriously different. So we don't need to, to you know, you know, for Muslim to recognize a, a, a Trinity in order to live peacefully, just like, you, we, you know, uh, Christians do not need to uh, affirm the, 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 you know, the Muslim idea of Tawhid, which is, which is very different in order to, uh, you know, to peace, uh, to live side by side. So, but, yeah, I would agree with that. I'm sorry to jump in, but aren't, aren't they connected somehow that is attitudes towards the salvation of the other and friendship with the other? Because, um, I mean, uh, if you're an exclusivist in terms of salvation, so a Muslim who believes a non-Muslim, for example, is going to hell, or a Christian who believes a non-Christian is going to hell, um, it doesn't friendship with the other necessarily or consequently involve imposing or at least attempting to impose your religion on the other. So, I mean, and there are different degrees of this, right? Because I could say that, uh, listen, um, I know, I mean, at least my theological conviction is that you're doomed to hell because you're you're the other. You're not part of my religion. Um, and so I could, A, just do a lot of evangelism or dawah to try to save you. I mean, I would say, but I, this is friendship. I'm saving you from eternal damnation, right? Or, or I could even, especially, let's say, in a religious state, in the Islamic context, in certain Islamic countries, for example, argue that the state should use different mechanisms of power or authority to inculcate, let's say, Islam, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I could support a religious party in whatever Islamic country that would... Um, not only want the the adhan, to, the call to prayer to be done through loudspeakers, but also want, uh, even in public schools, Islamic education um, that would uh, give certain favors or rewards to people who convert to Islam. Um, and so use somehow state power for the sake of dawah. Uh, you, you see how I, what I'm trying to get at? I mean, wouldn't I be tempted, if I was an exclusivist, tempted to use various elements of compulsion or even coercion uh, to lead the other towards uh, what I think is salvation? But it depends on the level of, of respect to other, right? Yeah, yeah for, for some people, like if, if you believe that, you know, other people would go to hell, uh, you have to do something in order to save them uh, using all kind of tools that, that you have. If you are political leaders, you have to use your political authority to impose, uh, you know, your, your, your conviction. Uh, but, but the problem with this is that, uh, you know, faith is, is personal convictions, something that you cannot impose from outside, right? So, and I think that is the wisdom from the Quranic verse, as we already mentioned earlier, that there is no conversion and religion. It's because faith is something that cannot be imposed from outside. Even if you try to impose using any political tool, and if, you know, uh, you, people may, may say that, yes, I convert to your religion, but in their heart, they are still, they still keep their own faith. Right. So, so whatever reason, um, you know, what is needed, I guess, is is simply to have, uh, you know, respect um, of of those differences. So, um, so I, I, it's remind it remind me of uh, a wisdom mentioned by early Muslim scholars who said, "Let's work together, you know, uh, on whatever we agree, we agree, and we respect each other in whatever we disagree." Mm. I think it's a very interesting point you raise about the nature of faith. Uh, so just to follow up on, on your point there, um, you're arguing that faith is not just a confession. So, I mean, uh, someone someone might say, well, no, for Islam, faith is a proclamation of the Shahada in mm -hmm. front of a few witnesses. Um, and that's faith. 
Yeah. Uh, but you're suggesting that no, it's maybe intellectual conviction or something maybe more spiritualized, but something interior. Yes, it is something interior. So that's a, that what Fed is all about. Mm. Very interesting. Okay, let me ask one more thing on this before we move on to some specific Quranic passages uh, about about pluralism. Uh, so we sort of problematized exclusivism a little bit. Uh, so I want to problematize pluralism. Um, I mean, do you think it's is it intellectually coherent? Can you be a thinking person and say that conflicting religions are all true? Um, uh, obviously, as some of our viewers may know, there is an intellectual current known as perennialism, mm -hmm. which holds this. Uh, there's also, you know, there's a there's a religious denomination um, that has some following in the United States of Unitarian Universalists, who basically hold something something like that. Um, and I think there's a lot of people mm -hmm. who are spiritual not religious at least in the western context maybe in indonesia uh, there's some of this as well you could comment on that if you will but def definitely in in the in american societies a lot of people say, i'm spiritual not religious and and i just don't like institutionalized religion and if you push a little more they'll say well i think all religions anyway teach the same thing um so uh but then people push back and they're like well that's that's lazy that's just lazy because if you actually look, you gave us example of Trinity and Tawhid, uh, and we could come up with a dozen more examples just with Christianity and Islam. I mean, isn't it intellectually problematic to be a pluralist when you have, how can you say that conflicting things are all true? I mean, each of the, th the three categories, you know, is, is problematic actually. Okay. So okay. Exclusivism, even in inclusivism and pluralisms are problematic. And as 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 you know that you know the categories are, are 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 have been put into question by many scholars, right? So some scholars argue that this this uh, you know three topology exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism uh, is is the, the, the topology is not coherent because it it doesn't capture the dynamic of of faith, right? So you know can can you think that you know that people believe can can only be a group under <laughs> these three categories? So of course it's not, um, and 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 as as far as I know, uh, many other scholars uh, develop uh, different categories because they are not convinced by each of these categories. So uh, it's it remind me of Han Kung. Um, you know, in nineteen nineties, he wrote a book. He wrote a very interesting title, very interesting article entitled "What Is a True Religion," in which he even 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 though he he is often classified as as um as an uh, inclusivist or pluralist, but he questioned the, the category itself, which is quite interesting. Okay. That he, okay. he problematized the category that he himself followed. Like, you know, he developed a different category. He said, you know, the category the, the category that he proposed instead of exclusivism, pluralism, uh, inclusivism, and pluralism, he said, uh, he, he mentioned like uh, four categories. Either one religion is true or no religion is true or every religion is true or one religion is true um, in whose truth that other religion participate. Yes. So he developed yes. you know, four categories instead of just three categories because he's not convinced that, that the three categories, exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism capture you know, the, the dynamic of, 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 of people you know, believe. And um, another uh, scholar from Fuller Seminary, uh, Protestant scholar, uh, fairly Mati Karnikan, I guess. Uh, I, I, I read his book entitled An Introduction to uh, Theology of Religion. Uh, he developed different categories because he also he's also not convinced okay. by, okay. by exclusivism. He used the term ec exclusiocentrism, like emphasis on the church. On the church. Mm -hmm. Yes, that there is no salvation outside the church. This one category. And the second category, he used the term uh, Christocentrism meaning that salvation only through Christ, like the center is in Christ. And the third category, he used the term uh, theocentrism, meaning that, that, that when we talk about interreligious issues, you should, you should not focus on Christ, but rather on the idea of God. God, theos. Yeah. Because once you mention Christ, then it's, it's, it blow up. Oh, yes. you know? And the, third, the fourth category that he used, uh, reality centrism. 
you know, just focus on the idea to include of non non monotheistic religions. Yes, al -Haq, like you know, we are we are spiritualists but not religious. Something that you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, and and there's a, I mean, a complication to interreligious dialogue is uh, people are tempted to think of well, we all believe in God. We all believe in one God, even. There are the Abrahamic religions in the Islamic world. It's common, as you know, to speak about the celestial or the heavenly religions, meaning only Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, with Buddhism, um, and obviously there are variations between Mahayana and Theravada Buddhism, but things are much complicated, let alone with certain Chinese religious movements like Confucianism and, and Taoism. So uh, <laughs> it's complicated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Priyanalist pre pre philosophers and also even John Hague used this term reality, reality. to talk about uh, about uh, you know how this reality uh, manifests in different idea of gods, right? So you know, in Christianity, the idea of Christ; in Islam, the idea of of Tawhid. Like in other in other religious traditions. Uh, you know this idea, this this reality might manifest in different ways. Yes, so that's what uh, Renal is. Yeah. The, the point you raised about uh, participation when you're speaking on Hans Kuhn, yeah, uh, is interesting. I I bet he's sort of riffing on the thought of the Jesuit Karl Rahner, who developed this term anonymous Christian, right, um, <laughs> to categorize certain non Christians, and he Rahner Kuhn. In my opinion, inclines towards pluralism and sometimes yeah, yeah. sort of radically so, uh, and is it, for me is not always coherent. Uh, Rahner wanted to maintain the centrality of Christ and the church, and so he develops this idea of anonymous Christian. He also wanted to be generous towards the others, so he he mm -hmm. said, well, in different ways, non Christians can still participate in the saving life, death, and resurrection of Christ. And so he said, not anonymous Christian. And he wanted to be generous with this term. And people yeah. have pointed out, like, well, what if they don't want to be an anonymous Christian? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. They just want to be a Muslim or a Buddhist or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's remind me of uh, Gavin da Costa, who criticized Rahna, because he said, well, that is really insult to other people. Yes. You think yes. that Muslims are not aware of that, that they are, they are, they are Christians, something like exactly. that? Exactly, exactly. And I, I actually think with Judaism, it's especially complicated because yeah. of the, the legacy uh the legacy with judaism um but yeah so I, and there is something similar uh, uh everyone we're going to get onto a few quran verses so i promise we'll, we'll shift the trans the conversation in a moment but i, I think there's something similar a, a similar phenomenon takes place with islam and muslims mm -hmm. where um the argument will be made that well um, and we'll probably get to this point, but Islam means submission. A Muslim is one who submits. Yes. And so, um, in a way, many Christians, maybe all Christians, are anonymous Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, as long as they have a disposition of submission to God, a sense of the fear of God, taqwa, something like that. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that. I've heard Christians trying to form bonds or start conversations with Muslims by saying, well, I'm a Muslim too just you know uh a christian muslim <laughs> <laughs> yes yes so arida used that term uh, that I've, you know every uh the, the message of all prophet is the same which is al islam <laughs> mm. it's a it also remind me of uh, the work of spanish uh, theologian raimundo panicar uh, mm. wrote a book entitled the unknown christ in in hinduism mm. so, which is somehow similar to what rahna uh, used the term anonymous christians so yes Yes. Well, let's speak about, uh, this is a good transition, actually, because we're getting to some of the terms, starting with um, al-Islam, uh, that are really key for understanding the Quranic perspective on the other. Uh, I wanted to mention two verses, both from Al-Imran, which is Surah 3 in the Quran. And they, um, they're they interesting in different ways. So first is Surah 3, verse 19, which just begins simply, in Nadina and Allahi al-Islam. Mm -hmm. In Nadin, so usually rendered, and you can explain further. In Nadin, indeed, religion and the law, according to God or with God, Al Islam is Islam or is submission. So that's one, that's 319, everyone. And then another is later in Al Imran, which is uh, verse 85, 
which uh, in Arabic is وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Usually rendered, whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, it will not be accepted from him, and in the hereafter, he will be among the losers. So uh, in both verses, we have Islam and Deen. Uh, these are often cited as verses to support the exclusivist position. Uh, yeah, what, what should we know about these words, these verses, and how they're interpreted? Yeah, I agree with you. This is uh, an example of uh, the Quranic verses that, that display uh, something that we may call an exclusivist theology, right? That Islam is the only true religion. Um, how, uh, however, you know, this verse has been understood by Muslim scholars differently uh, throughout the centuries. Um, so the, the, the central issue among Muslim uh, exegetes is precisely how the word al-Islam should be understood. Uh, so we find a diversity of interpretation among Muslim exegetes. Um, while you know it is true that uh, you know most Muslim scholars who wrote tafsir or Quranic exegesis are mostly you know traditionalists. Uh, so liberal or progressive Muslim do not often do not write uh, Quranic exegesis. That's an but interesting it, point, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. That's, when that's you look at your awesome. library, like we both have behind us, yeah, tafsir, yeah. Uh, you might most, not find a liberal progressive tafsir among most, most, Yeah, mostly or if not all, you know, only traditionalists who wrote Quranic exegesis, perhaps with with, with one exception, uh, which is um, Abul Kalam Azad from India, something that we can we can talk later. Mm. So, uh, but 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 still, we find a diversity of views among among Muslim scholars. So, for instance, um, Rashid Rida uh, from Egypt, who uh, you know, uh, who was uh, the disciple of Muhammad Abdul, right, the Muslim reformer, uh, make distinction between Al Islam as the name of religion brought by Muhammad, and Al Islam in its general meaning, which is uh, well, just something that we just mentioned, you know, a submission. Uh, surrender to the will of God or something like that. So he made this this uh, this uh, this uh, distinction, and he spent a great deal of time talking about the etymology of the word al-Islam, and he emphasized the point that al-Islam in this verse in particular refer to uh, the term that he used um, ar-ruh al-kulli, mm -hmm. uh, meaning uh, universal spirit. So this is this is what what the argument goes that that all prophets in the past before Muhammad, they basically, they basically brought the same message, which is al-Islam, surrender to or submission to the will of God. Uh, but 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 uh, uh, Rida doesn't, you know, go further. It was Ab Abul Kalam Azad uh, from India, who is very explicit in his discussion of the verse, uh, making a distinction between al-Islam as favored by God, which is an attitude of submission, surrender and obedience, uh, uh, you know, to God, and Al Islam as system, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a, as 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 an organized religion. So, so he says that once this Al Islam, a submission, become nizam, become a system, then it claim it exclusive his right to salvation which which i found really interesting uh, the way he distinguishes between islam as a, as a, as a, as a pure submission to the will of god yes. and islam as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a groups right mm. uh, like uh, not, the the you term you used before nizam meaning order no, or, meaning system, system, or yeah <laughs> nizam meaning system but but I I should say that you know not all Muslim commentators offer this sort of inclusive reading, but it is still it, it is important I think I guess to point out the nuance among Muslim interpretations, both mm -hmm. classical and and modern, uh, rather than you know uh, refer to simple characterization that I mean, all Muslim everywhere are the same. Isn't the issue with both of these verses when we say in the Deen and Allah al Islam, when we say many abtaghi ghar al Islam, Deenan falan yukbala minhu. Isn't the issue also, I mean, even if you take Islam as the name, as a nizam, as an order, or the name of a sy systematic religion, uh, it still leaves a question open of what does it mean then to be Muslim? Uh, do you have to be 
perfectly practicing? Yes. Um, do you have to pray? Uh, is it enough just to say the Shahada? Uh, uh, do you have to have the right uh, doctrinal convictions? Um, I'm probably throwing out too much here, so you can comment on whatever you want. But obviously, the, the, there are analogous questions for other religions too. But for example, what if your your creed or aqidah is of one kind? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe someone will say, "Well, that's not the right that's not the right aqidah or creed." What yeah. you believe about God or a whole number of things. Um, what if you have limited intellectual capabilities, like me, <laughs> or not to make a joke of it, but seriously, people who have limited uh, intellectual capabilities who are not able to understand the basic teaching of Islam mm -hmm, mm -hmm. are they still Muslim uh, yeah. I don't know if you want to comment on any of that I mean so do you see my point even if you don't yeah, take yeah, it as yeah. a general idea of submission which is open to people of any of any religion and you say no this is a religion still what does it mean to be Muslim right right yeah exactly that is like the question like what what does it mean to be Muslim? You know who who can who can be you know who who can evaluate that one 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 consider the 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 Islamicness of of, of Muslim, right? So when the Quran says uh, that whoever follow other than Islam will not be accepted, what does this really mean? That what kind of Islam that 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 is regarded as 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 which is you know. Um, uh, the, the Islam mentioned in in this text is it um, you know about practice? Is it about belief? Is it about everything? You know, because for some people, Islam is not just faith, right? Islam is uh, you know way of life. Like it's, it's not just about um, you know gut gut human relationship, but also human you uh, you know interhuman relationship can be also considered Islam. So some some you know modern uh, you know islamist uh, people t tend to think that islam is both religion and dawla right both din and dawla mm -hmm. so what does this term islam mean so it's it's really remind me of uh, of the indonesian uh, muslim uh, exegete hamka you know in in the 1970s hamka uh, as as a reformer he used this, uh, this, uh, you know, his, his his ideological orientation as a reformer to interpret this particular verse in the Quran, because in the 1970s, uh, you know, there are, there were many Muslims who claim to be Muslim in their ID card, but they do not practice basically. So in uh, Indonesia, it, it, yes, specifically. In, right in Indonesia, in, we, we we know the term you know islam katepe meaning islam in the id in the id card so they claim to be muslims uh in in the id but but in reality they practice um you know uh, uh um, syncretism or it's called gejawen in indonesia meaning uh, local animist, animistic practices so as a reformer uh, Hamka used this particular verse in, of the Quran in order to challenge the practice of Muslims in the country because he 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 think himself as a reformer. He tried to reform the you know uh, you know the, the the Muslim practice in the country. Mm -hmm. So the Quran can be you know can be interpreted in different ways uh, you know according to different ideological orientations. So that what make the, you know any scripture is beautiful, right? Because because not only that the text itself open to different interpretation, that the text, whether the Quran or the Bible is polyvalent, it open to variety of interpretation, but also the agency of interpreters. You know, this is- so, Let me push a little bit more on that question. Uh, I hope we're not going too far away from what we promised to speak about. But I mean, doesn't this raise the question of authority in mm -hmm. Islam? Um, if there, if there are these questions surrounding what it is to be Muslim, uh, yeah. presumably you, you, well, maybe you don't, I don't know, <laughs> maybe you need, uh, an arbiter or someone who can answer those questions. Uh, so, and obviously the ulama do that. So the scholars in Islam, the ulama do that, or, or a mufti, a legal jurisprudent will give an opinion, a fatwa. On you know, for example, are you still Muslim if you don't pray? Are you still Muslim if your if, if your doctrine or aqidah is apparently or, or supposedly unorthodox? Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, but I mean, it just it it 
means that the, the question of authority is very interesting. Yes. And then, uh, you know, the ulama come and say, well, we're the authority. Well, who is the alim? Who is the right. scholar? And where, what is the basis for the principle that the ulama should have the authority to decide for the believers? Again, I'm a non-Muslim, so I'm really, really not actually trying to push one side or the other. I'm just sort of finding interesting questions here about how uh, religion would get through or work through these, these matters. Yeah, I mean, the question of authority is certainly central here. Uh, who, who, can, who can decide, you know, that one, one can remain a Muslim or not? You know, if someone doesn't practice certain elements of Islamic practices, if someone, you know, you know uh, pray, but, but doesn't uh, fast <laughs> because of uh, many other reasons, you know, is he is he or she still uh, Muslim or not? Right. So, so certainly, you know, but but in, in the context of interpretation, it's really complicated. You know, uh, you know whether there is a you know only one true meaning of of the text. Right. This is central for any kind of interpretation where the meaning can be found. Right. Um, do we know what is intended by the author? You know, in the context of the Quran, do we really know that that is what what Allah really mean when we interpret? So, them? is the solution then to be sola scriptura to say the text alone? I mean, the text should be the arbiter itself. Well, well, there are at least like you know, from from modern perspective, there are at least three major approaches, right? One is the text should be the arbitrator, meaning that 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 the the, the meaning of the text it is what is intended by the author. So and therefore, the task of any interpreter is to discover the meaning intended by the author. But the problem is that we do not know what, what is intended by the author, right? And then the second approach says, like, well, you know, the, the, you know, the arbiter should not be the text, but rather the context, right? So in order to know the meaning of the text, you have to understand the context in which certain texts emerge. So the meaning is not in the text, but rather behind the text. It is in the context. So that's the, the second approach. The third approach is more, you know, emphasis on the reader, the role of the reader, right? So the meaning is not in the text, nor behind the text, but rather in front of the text. It is the reader who create the meaning in bring into the text. Although each one of these is problematic, but but that uh, my point is to show how complex is the yes, issue. Yes, yes. And people might say for that third option, uh, it sounds attractive, uh, that the reader can decide, um, but it, uh, people might say, well, this is the path towards uh, disagreement, dissension, and division within the community if everyone makes up their own mind. Yeah, everyone speak, you know, for for Islam. <laughs> you make, defines, defines Islam for themselves. Yeah, yeah it's a really complicated issue. So uh, in that, um, the social, uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, appeal to the need for social cohesion um, it could undermine or complicate that position right that e that the yeah, yeah. the meaning lies ultimately with with the reader um yeah very interesting okay I, can I get on to another verse we'll yeah. maybe do two more uh so th there's many more we could speak about maybe uh, that will be our third session we'll get to the others but I'd like to get in maybe two more one is a verse you spoke about uh earlier um, so this is Surat the Tawbah, verse 29. So um, this is another verse, as you mentioned, cited as sort of in defense of exclusivism. Yes. So as you mentioned, it begins, fight those who do not believe in God and in the last day and who do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden and who do not follow the religion of truth. And then specifically says, um, among those who are given the scripture. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is not a command to fight against the pagans or the mushrikun, but against min um, aladina uh, ut al kitab is the Arabic right. against those who were given al kitab or scripture, and then um, the fighting stops apparently when these al uh, kitab or people of the book do two things: they pay uh, the jizya, or they give the jizya literally. Um, and then there's the complicated phrase, which maybe we can just yeah. set aside because it's very difficult to understand. 
And then the final phrase, Wahum Salhirun, and they are, I think you translated that humble. Um so uh I don't know, we've covered some of the complicating uh, factors when thinking about this sort of material. Um I, but I, I'm a, I'm interested in in how some of the exegetes that you've studied, um, you know, especially in your 2014 book, a scriptural polemics, um what did they say? Because, you know, in, in fact, uh, this has not been, uh, this verse has not led to just a cons consistent campaigns of Muslims against Jews and Christians. In fact, in a place like Indonesia, of course, there's a long history of remarkable coexistence between religions, not perfect, but I mean, generally, there's been coexistence. This is generally the rule, right? So um, an exegete will look at or take um, Abul Kalam Azad, you mentioned in India. Here you're dealing with a Hindu majority, but still also a Christian population, a very diverse uh, context. So people are living with the other. And um, and but these exegetes read this verse. So they, they must find a way to reconcile the verse with uh, the peaceful coexistence that they want and experience in their countries. Yeah, there, there are at least uh, two things that draw uh, exegetical attention among modern Muslim scholars. So the first one is 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 um, you know the first line of 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 of, of the verse uh, when the the Quran says, um, uh, "Fight those who do not believe in God in the last day, uh, and do not uh, forbid what God has forbidden." So, so this this phrase uh, poses an ex exegetical difficulty to Muslim uh, commentators, because the Quran, as you can see, attribute three uh, negative um, characteristics, right? Uh, that they do not believe in God in the last day. So, what does it mean for the people of the book that they do not believe, you know, in the last day, you know, in in God in the last day? Of course, they do believe in in God in the last day. So, this is certainly difficult for some Muslim, uh, you know. How to understand this this difficult passage? It seem it seem easy to understand, but it is certainly difficult when the Quran says that the people of the book they do not believe in God in the last day. What does this really mean, right? And and the second uh, issue that draw uh, exegetical attention is the idea of jizya and the idea of poll tax um, here in, in in this in this in this uh, in in this verse. So as we know that in the in the classical Muslim society. Uh, that non-Muslim uh, living in Islamic lands, they have to pay this pool tax, this jizya, um, and 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 return. They they will be protected in their life, in their property, and they can keep their religions. So um, so because of the nature of of the protection, uh, this the non-Muslim uh, they are often called as the people of the the people of zimma, like ahlu zimma. Yes, the people of protections. Yes, right? uh, for some people that they have very limited civil and political right, and therefore they become like second class citizen, if we mm -hmm. can use the term. Mm -hmm. So, um, Rosid Rida, uh, in my uh, in my study of his Tafsir Al Manat, he 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 raised an interesting question concerning uh, whether jizya, you know, this poll tax is originated from Islam or, or is it taken from uh, the practice of other civilizations? Mm. So uh, in his journal, Al-Manar, he published the work of uh, an Indian Muslim scholar, Shibli Nukmani, who basically argued that, uh, that Jizya is Persian in its origin. Mm. So Rida used this uh, article by Shibli Nukmani uh, in order to don't play the important or the significant of jizya in the modern context. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't go even, uh, you know, much further. But but interestingly, um, you know, contemporary uh, Egyptian scholar, uh, Fahmi Huwaidi, who wrote a book entitled Al Muatinon Al which is the title is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Citizens, uh, citizens, not, uh, not dimis. Not dimis. Yes, Muatinon Al uh, in which he. Uh, you know, argue strongly that 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 this uh, the mitchud. I don't. Uh, you, uh, you know, this this term the mitchud. You know, has been used by by uh, some scholars. So this 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 uh, the mitchud is a is a political institution rather than religious one. So he said that with the emergence of nation state, 
the concept of zima you know paying gizya and so forth you know is, is no longer relevant so i found this quite interesting the work of um Tommy Huwadi, who basically argue that 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 the, 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 the this notion of the Michu, the second second class citizen that Muslims have to pay jizya and so forth should be discarded altogether in the modern context. Well, I think there, there's it's, this has raised a number of points which you've just said for me, and I don't think we can address all of them. And I'm thinking of all different questions I'd like to ask, which again make me think of a, a third session if I could possibly convince you. But I mean, it, it's it's it just shows your discussion of the exegetes on Quran 929, how important uh, to use a very fancy word hermeneutics is yes. your method of reading of reading scripture or your 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 way of understanding scripture. Um, and, and there are some exegetes probably, and it doesn't sound like Rashid Dridda is really among them, um, who will say, well, we just have recourse to hadith. Mm -hmm. And um, hadith will explain Quran when there's ambiguity. Yeah. We just a uh, revelation explains revelation, um, and uh, that I, I would think you might say, well, that doesn't really solve the problem because we also need to contextualize hadith. <laughs> right. And even if we set aside questions of authenticity and antiquity, um, I don't know if you want to comment on that because you could say, well, it's easy to answer what sahirun means. Or mm -hmm. what jizya means? Just there are hadith about these things. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are there are hadith with regard to the Quran. This this term jizya is uh, is is havak legomenon. It is only in this verse that the word jizya occur, which raises a really interesting question. If the term jizya is so central in political, you know, governance in the Islamic tradition, <laughs> why is it that this term only occur one time mm -hmm. in the Quran? Yes. So, which is quite interesting that the whole notion of the people of Dhimma is based on this one term, jizya, right? So, which occur only one time. Yes. So, I don't know whether this, you know, this says something about the significance of, of the concept itself, uh, whether it is, it is, you know, religiously significant or it is simply politically significant because of, you know, the context in which, you know, yes. uh, Muslim develop their political theories. The, me the messiness of human history. And <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, let's look at one more verse before we wrap up. I think this will sure. be sort of the last question or at the end I'll ask you how people can stay in touch with your work. Uh, I was going to refer to more than just this verse on sort of the inclusivist pluralist side, but um, let's let's look at uh, Surat Al-Ma'idah, verse 48. So this is sort of number five. And important to note that this sort of is by tradition um, one of the last, if not the last, surahs to be proclaimed by the Prophet Muhammad. And I'm just going to read a bit from the second, it's a long verse, so the second yeah. part of the verse. Uh, this will be well known to people who are interested in interreligious dialogue because of its message. Uh, so we read uh, the second part of Quran 548. <laughs> Meaning something like, if God had wished, he would have made you a single community, but he tests you through what he has given you. So compete in righteousness. To God is your return, all of you. Then he will inform you regarding your differences. You know, I don't know if we can do justice to this. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been speaking about an hour. Somewhere around there, people who are watching will know exactly how long we've been speaking because they'll see it on their YouTube. Uh, and, I mean, we could probably speak another hour just about this verse. It raises all sorts of interesting questions um, about divine... Does God will actually a diversity of communities? Mm -hmm. uh, he... Obviously, the implication of this verse is that he did not will to make a single community, yeah. but then it immediately follows that by saying uh, that apparently the reason for the diversity is so that God could test you, if that's how you understand li So, yeah. yeah, thoughts about that? Yeah, this is beautiful passage actually. So this is uh, this is an example of how how complex is the message of the Quran, right? If if we read the Quran through 
chronological reading, how, how about this? I mean, this is one of the exactly. latest exactly. chapters of the Quran, but still, uh, you know, includes some very inclusive um, message here. So, um, so we, we can begin with, you know, with, with this phrase, that for each one of you, we have created shir'a, I mean, perhaps law, uh, you know, from sharia, the same, the same root, and then minhaj is way of life. Um, so, so, so that's uh, just I, I didn't read that part. That's just yeah. just before in the verse. Just before, I just, probably uh, should have started with that. So thanks. Just, for uh, phrase that. before the, the reason why oh. this is significant because this is uh, an indication of diversity. Well, equaling Jana for each one of you. Who 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 are who are this each one of you? So um so some some Muslim exegetes uh you know uh understand this phrase as 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 referent to uh, the people of Moses the people of Jesus and the people of Muhammad. So um, so for each one of these communities, uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslim, uh, if God so will, he will make you a single people. So, but that is not what God... So the idea, the, the question is whether this is about that diversity of, of religions uh, is will by God or or God rather allow this diversity to happen. So that's, I think, the central issue. Whether Can I comment diversity... on that point? It's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, again, maybe we speak about this more in another episode. But it's it, in the document signed by Pope Francis mm -hmm. and Ahmed Tayyib, the Sheikh of Al-Azhar. Yes. Uh, there's the line here, which I think is actually uh, connected to this verse, although most yep. Western observers miss that which said that God willed a diversity of religions. I think yes. it's a verse. It could be yes. plurality. I might be, it might yes. be plurality. Yes, the text, the text says that pluralism and diversity of religion, race, culture, and so forth is willed by God. So the document is very explicit. The diversity of religion, skin, culture is willed by God. So it and is so, sort of willed by God. So willed yeah. by God. And uh, this document, which is known as the Document of Human Fraternity, was criticized by many Catholics who said, well, the language you've used implied that it's God's active will for a diversity of religions or plurality of religions. And uh, you, Pope Francis, should have made it clear that according to Catholic teaching, the standard Catholic teaching, um, the diversity of religions can only be seen as God's permissive will. So a word like permits or allows would have been better. So anyway, yeah, I think I think you know the, the, this uh, this phrase uh, that diversity is the will of God uh, has uh, an important uh, theological implication. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, you know, because the document as well as the verse of the Quran seem to suggest that that diversity is the will of God. In fact, some Muslim scholars, including a scholar from Indonesia, Nokolis Majid, for instance, uh, refer to this particular verse and then argue that this this particular verse of the Quran is that this is the term that he used is the Quranic manifesto of religious pluralism. So I like the term; it's beautiful. So the Quranic manifesto of religious. Yeah, it, you know, it, it is that, that that some that, you know that that the verse can be understood in different ways. I I guess. What What do you think? Maybe last final last point. Yeah, what I mean, about the language uh, to test you? What, what, how do you How do you see that? How do interpreters understand that? Uh, does this mean that? Uh, plurality is not actually a good thing, but uh, is just a way of, I don't know, tempting maybe, trying uh, Muslims uh, to see if actually they'll, they'll stand firm as Muslims. Yeah, I think it's connected to uh, to what, what come after, like liyabluakum fima atakum, in order to test you in what in in what uh, he meaning God has given you, and then the, this beautiful phrase fasta bikul khairat compete with one another in good work. So so um, I think it's still um, you know a positive message here. If kum refer to the three religious tradition, right? So uh, if 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 I that's God, an important point. So it's yeah. it, you see the kum not as being addressed but only not, to not the to, Muslims, but yes, to not Muslim, but rather to the three communities, if understood in that way. Right. 
Yes. And then compete with the one. And this is like beautiful phrase. So you know that this is this is this phrase, uh 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 fast compete with, with one another in good work, is the motto of Muhammadiyah in, in Indonesia. Mm. So, so Muhammadiyah, the one of the largest Muslim organizations in the country, use this phrase "fastabikul khairat" as as the motto of the organization. Beautiful. So compete with one another in good work. So it's a bit, it's really beautiful. Yes, yes, I agree. Well, there's so much more to speak about. Hopefully, we'll have you back uh, before we conclude. Uh, it, what if people want to stay in touch with your work, get to know uh, more of it, and see uh, you know your your latest publications? How should they stay in touch with you? Well, uh, they can follow my my Twitter uh, at Monim Siri. Uh, although I'm not really very active, but if I have new publication, I will share through uh, through my Twitter account. So yes, uh, you can follow my Twitter. Terrific. Yeah, and just a reminder to everyone. First of all, thank you for watching through the whole episode. <laughs> If you're still there, thank you. We really appreciate it. And uh, I mean, it's this is again just an incredible resource. Buy all of uh, Francis Suri's books. So his book on scriptural polemics, his book on traditionalism and revisionism. But this is the latest one from De Gruyter, um, the Quran with cross references. Again, is a tool that every student and scholar of the Quran should have. Munim, a friend, thank you so much. Uh, I hope to have you another time. But thank you for this time. Thank you so much. Thank you for for the conversation. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the, um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.